Welcome to the Korea Society's Arts and Culture Live webcast, East Goes West, Yong Hul Kang, His Life and Works with Alexander Chi and Ed Park. I'm Tom Byrne, President of the Korea Society. Today, Yong, sorry, Yong Hul Kang is rightfully recognized as the first Korean American novelist and a pioneer of Asian American literature. His autobiographical novels, The Grass Roof and East Goes West, garnered much critical acclaim and commercial success when first published in the 1930s. However, the writer and his incandescent novels were largely forgotten by the general public for decades until the reissue of East Goes West, first by Kaya Press in 1997, and then by Penguin Classics in 2019. Fortunately for us, the rediscovery by the two publishing houses brought his life and work back to the minds of scholars and readers. Alexander Chi, who provided the insightful forward to the Penguin Classics edition, is one of our two speakers this evening. Mr. Chi is the best-selling author of the novels, The Queen of the Night and Edinburgh, and the essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. The winner of many literary awards, including a Whiting, he is an Associate Professor of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College. Also joining us tonight is Ed Park. His article on East Coast West appeared in the New York Review of Books. Mr. Park is the author of the novel Personal Days and his short fiction has appeared in the New Yorker. He is a founding editor of The Believer and was executive editor at Penguin Press. It is our honor to host these two distinguished guests to talk about the emergence of Korean American literature and Yong Hul Kang's life and legacy. I am especially eager to hear what Alexander and Ed have to say about East Coast West. On a personal note, the picaresque adventure is one of my favorite genres. And I'll turn the screen over to Senior Director of our Arts and Culture Program, Jay O who has brought to us tonight another program, at least for me, will further broaden my literary and cultural horizons. Jay, the screen is yours. Thank you, Tom, for your introduction. Welcome to the Korea Society, Alexander and Ed. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions via email, artsandculture at koreasociety.org or Twitter at Korea Society Art. So before we start talking about his books, I thought I would give a short sort of a summary of um, Yong Ho Gang's life um, in case some people are not really familiar with his life. Um, Yong Ho Gang was born in 1903 in a small village in Hamgyong province with, in what is now known as North Korea. He was educated in Korea and Japan and participated in the March one first independence movement of 1919, after which he was imprisoned and brutally tortured. Kang immigrated to the US in 1921 with help of American missionaries. He attended a university in Canada first, and then he studied in Boston at Boston University and Harvard. Um, then he began to write and publish articles in the New York Times, in The Nation, the Saturday Review of Literature and Encyclopedia Britannica, among others. He worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and taught English at New York University. And that is where he became friends with his fellow professor, Thomas Wolfe, who introduced him to Scribner's legendary editor, Maxwell Perkins. Kang's first book, edited by Maxwell um, Perkins, The Grass Roof, was published by Scribner in 1931. A children's book based on this book um, entitled The Happy Grove was published in 1933 and East Coast West was released in 1937. Kang was a recipient of numerous awards and honors, including two Guggenheim fellowships. I believe he was the first Asian to ever receive the Guggenheim fellowship. And he lived in Long Island with his family for many years before he passed away in 1972 at his home in Florida. And I think if you have read East Goes West, um, you may have noticed many similarities in the life of Yong Hyo Kang and that of the main protagonist and narrator of his two novels, Chong Pahan. Um, Alex and Ed, um, before we delve into 
East Coast West. Ed, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about his first novel, The Grass Roof? Sure. Um, just hold up a copy. This is a copy of the reprint in 1966. Uh, but it first came out in 1931 when he met uh, Maxwell Perkins through Thomas Wolfe. Um, he apparently gave him, uh, Wolfe brought Perkins some of the pages and Perkins cut him a check for I think $500, which he said was the, like the most money he'd ever seen. Um, far more than he you know, made teaching. Um, uh, and he finished the book. It came out to great acclaim. Uh, perhaps its biggest champion was Rebecca West, who um, famous famous British uh, novelist and journalist, who um, wrote the the most kind of glowing incandescent review for it. Um, it actually turns up it's repurposed as the introduction to this to this reprint, but it um, concludes what a writer, what a man! Exclamation point. And you know it. One thing about the grass roof is it's um, you know it's a story of his, his the upbringing of somebody you know whose whose life is congruent to, to his own. Um, it's a life of wanderlust, beginning as a as a pretty young precocious kid. He knows he needs a better education than he can get in his small village. Um, he undertakes this. Uh, several hundred mile journey to Seoul at a at a tender age. Um, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's it's like he's twelve or something or eleven. Right, right. Um, and then you know even Seoul is not good enough, and he needs to go to Japan. So it's it's quite exciting. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of movement. Um, the early chapters are a very kind of tender, almost Edenic. Um, representation of the you know the village where he's from and the family ties and his he has these various uncles uh some of them are very eccentric um in short i think this is you know for an american reader uh or an anglophone reader this is this is something they probably had never seen before and so this comes out in 31 uh japan you know is, has taken over korea and this is really a cri de curve you know <laughs> desperately, um, you know, trying to state Korea's case, right? And it, one of the, the, the main climax, like you said, is at the March 1st demonstration in 1919. And he actually, in the book, there's a full translation of the Declaration of Independence that is read in the various town squares in Korea. Um, and I think uh, this is a different topic, but that translation kind of gets repurposed. I've seen it pop up in other places without like attribution to him. Um, and it, you know, I'm not spoiling anything, but it is the story of how he finally just has to leave. And, and, and uh, it's, it's quite exciting. There are a couple attempts to leave and he gets caught. There's like um, people he thinks are spies. Uh, it's, I would say a different book though. It's a different book than East Goes West though they share the same narrator, the same protagonist. Um, there are some um, modernist touches. I just, I don't know if people can see. There's one point where he talks about a kind um, uh, woman at a sort of boarding house who's looking after him and her voice is so musical that he represents it as uh, the words, almost um, like words. musical notes. It's just, you know, he, I think what it shares with, with East Goes West is this kind of like, life force, right? Um, and then maybe this, I'll, I'll stop talking about the grass roof, but you know, when we get into East Goes West, the first couple pages, he's describing how Korea is gone. It's like destroyed. He, he really describes it as a, as a planet that's been destroyed. Um, and you know, there's no, there's no future for him there. So that's why he, that's why he comes to America. And that's where um, East Coast West begins. Um, yes. Alex, in your forward to the Penguins Classic, Penguin Classics edition of East Goes mm. West, you wrote that, and I'm quoting you here, there is a seismic line to draw in Asian autobiographical novels by Asian American writers into the present, a line I'll draw all the way to myself. Um, 
How did you find out about this book, East Goes West? And what were your thoughts when you first read the book? I had become friendly with uh, the Kaya Press folks. And uh, I believe they are the ones who sent me a copy uh, when it was being reissued. And I, uh, I was... I was pretty startled to, to discover that, um, that he existed, that no one had ever told me about him. Um, I had already written my, and published my first book by then. And so uh, it was, you know, the influence that I can say that I feel he had on me uh, is one of those influences that comes with a writer where they've made an impact on the culture such that even if you have not read them, you are in a sense uh, working in the shadow of their work, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, for example, the way that uh, Carlos Bulasan was influenced by, uh, by him and wrote uh, America is the Heart, the way that uh, that book went on to become influential to uh, the writers that I ended up uh, reading and, uh, and learning from later. Uh, that's, that's what I mean about that, that seismic line. Um, you know, I think that, uh, the, the difficulty with, the difficulty with writing autobiographical fiction from that point of view comes in part because, uh, there's a truth that you come into possession of, uh, through the circumstances of your life. And in a sense, operating in some kind of purely fictional mode uh, requires you to give that up and not make use of it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, autobiographical fiction has some of the qualities uh, of a, you know, of, a, of an expose. It's a way of uh, a way of revealing uh, conditions that uh, perhaps aren't being reported on in the news, for example. Like the even just the things that are described in the grass roof, for example, uh, are the kinds of stories that the Japanese occupying government censored heavily at the time that uh, that it was written. And so, you know the the novel that he wrote was in a sense, uh, a way of getting the news out about what was happening in Korea at the time. Um, uh, a way that no one else was going to probably provide at that scale. I did a little math quickly uh, on his advance. It would have been about $10,000 at that time that he did, um, which is a, it's a lot of money to leave someone's office with when you don't expect it. <laughs> Uh, and it's also, I suppose, notable that this was happening during the Depression, right? It's true. It was the Depression era launch uh, yeah. for his career. I would also just add, I mean, not to dwell on, I mean, I think the Wolf, his relationship with Thomas Wolf is, is very interesting. I know, I'm not really quite sure how close they were. Like you can tell from his quotes, like they, they worked together and they were quite congenial. Um, you know, were they, were they best friends? Probably not, but you know, Wolf thought enough of uh, the pages that Kong had to, you know, to pass it on to Perkins. And that was obviously the key th thing, like how, what kind of chain of coincidences would lead to that? Uh, a writer of his talents coming, coming to the US, getting a job teaching comp English composition, meeting Thomas Wolf, meeting Max Perkins. What's, what's interesting and what Alex was talking about just about like what's not reported. Like, I just find it interesting that sort of the authoritative biography of, of Maxwell Perkins, there's no mention of Kong. It's like he didn't exist. And I, it just sort of breaks my heart because, um, you know, for, for us, for people who, who read him or are rediscovering him, uh, it's just kind of like, as Alex was saying, like to discover that such a person existed is kind of mind blowing. Um, anyway, but I'm happy that uh, East Coast West is in print now and that we're having this talk because I just think it's, it's 
kind of one of the best things I've read in years. And, uh, and it really feels, I'm sure we'll, th we'll say this again over the course of this uh, discussion, it just feels uh, timeless in, in the best ways. It feels very alive um, and enjoyable. I'd say. There's a real fearlessness uh, in the writing and uh, a feeling of freedom uh, that he seems to have that, um, that is enviable. You know, and I, and I wondered about, uh, about whether that was simply the result of the poetic tradition that he grew up with, uh, that he describes in, uh, in the grass roof, as well as in uh, East Goes West. I mean, one, one thing that I love about East Goes West is just how it's like Asian American or Asian immigrant poets wandering around the US, you know? <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, but especially in New York, which is certainly like, you know, a familiar enough uh, experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of great to see that, you know, and he's talking about the 20s and just to, to have that mental picture of, of these, uh, you know, Asian American, Korean American um, writers and poets kind of going around uh, doing their thing is, is pretty, is pretty fun to see, I have to say. Um. And there are so many episodes in the book, and I'm, I don't yeah. mean that, say, I'm not saying that the book is episodic in any way, it actually is not, but there are so many interesting characters and there are so many interesting episodes that happens and, and they really makes a very strong impression and really gives us the sense of time and place as well. Um, a lot of the people, so I, I'm just, just in case if no one has, for those who have not read the book, so the book starts with Chung Pa Han, who is the, uh, was the young boy in the grass roof. He arrives in New York um, with $4, uh, which he promptly spends on his haircut. Um, and then um, basically really starts at the very bottom of the New York City's um, urban life, um, you know, basically staying at homeless shelters and just always just trying to figure out a way to connect with somebody so he can move on to the next step. And that next step is actually quite elaborate because then he goes to college in Canada, then he comes back to the United States, he works in Philadelphia and Baltimore. So all these events happens. Um, was there any particular First of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Koreans in his book, um, the Koreans that he described, obviously his friends. Um, what do you think he was, because I always got the feeling that he's slightly different from the, and obviously every single Koreans are different, but um, he always viewed himself slightly different from the other Koreans who are in the book. And there aren't that many people, there are only a handful of them. And they all seem to kind of know each other or they find each other in the book. Yeah. Um, can you give us a sense of what it was like, what it must have been like for somebody mm -hmm. like Chongpa to come to New York in 1920s and find that group of people Sorry. And how you read that sort of um, that scene of all these Koreans getting together and trying to try to figure out a way to live in the United States. Um, how about you, Alex? Do you have any impression on that? Well, I mean, uh, there's a he has the he has a very uh, friendly first landing that he's trying to make in New York City that is very amusing, this guy who um, who sort of introduces him to uh, some of the some of the grooming needs of being an American. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, a very kind of uh, very kind of funny sort of um, comic, sweet. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot of sweetness. I think part of what mm -hmm. I loved about it was uh, th things like when he runs out of money almost immediately, uh, he finds himself at a Chinese restaurant and he tries to pay for his dinner with a poem that he writes on the spot, um, which is like such a romantic uh, and endearing 
uh, scenario that it's it's almost impossible to imagine someone being <laughs> that that green in New York City. Um, and yet <laughs> there he is. And the restaurant tour, to his credit, uh, treats him very kindly. Uh, and and thus do we learn that. At the time, Chinese restaurants in New York often made shift meals that were larger than uh, larger than what they needed to make for the people working for them, so they could feed people who were hungry, um, which is uh, which is very moving to me and reminds me of like some of the Chinatown mutual aid efforts that are happening even right now. Um, I think, in other words, that it probably wasn't so very different. Uh, you know, I, I'm my my own father, for example, when we moved to Maine in the 1970s, he created something called the Korean American Friendship Association of Maine, which was an organization that uh, helped mainstream uh, Korean immigrants back then who were arriving, uh, teaching them like, this is where you go to get a bank account. This is where you go to uh, to get a driver's license. These are the documents you need. That that kind of, uh, the kinds of experiences he has were not entirely unfamiliar to me. Uh, and, and it just was a question of like, how much farther back it went than I, than I thought it did. Right. Which is right. Yeah. I'm reminded of, there's a, as Alex was speaking, there's a, the Chinese restaurant scene is just, gr it's just great. It's just beautiful. Um, and you know, throughout, there's this kind of kinship with um, with with Chinese people in in, in America, uh, in New York, and in, in other cities. Um, but there's also something called the Korea Institute on 23rd Street. Like I love the the specificity of the addresses in right. this book. Um, and so I'll just read a couple sentences. The Korean Institute was in the Chelsea district, a grimy old-fashioned brick building that had seen better days. The section was very dirty. The, the section was very dirty, noisy, and plebeian. But the house inside was quiet and dignified. Um, the most attractive feature was the community dining room in the basement, uh, where real Korean food was prepared and served. So you can imagine, like, how great this would be for someone who hasn't, you know, has, hasn't had Korean food in, in months. Um, uh, it was a center for all kinds: bad atheists like George, who is his roommate; uh, good Methodists like Oak. Communists, capitalists, and all other categories, rich and poor. Um, of the rich, of course, not many. Koreans were generally ruined by this time by the Japanese occupation. Uh, besides, those counted as rich men in Korea were poor men in New York, where incomes dwindled to one third by the exchange. Um, it goes on and on, but there's also, he, you, so you meet at this place a bunch of Koreans, um, all guys at this point. Um, there's some talk of, a couple of Korean women that they like there's somebody from Hawaii that somebody has met but you don't they're not they're pretty much off screen um but there was, <laughs> there was there's one person the the reverend J.P. Oak uh, and then his his uh academic degrees follow um over there you see the reverend J.P. Oak A B B D A M S T M sometime to be if God helps PhD um, the people here in the Institute call him doctor because he's, he is hoping to get that title soon. But I just, just in a, in a very short paragraph, almost satirizing this sort of um, overachieving nature, uh, which I think probably a lot of people um, back then and even still had to, you know, immigrants um, had to kind of find it with, within themselves. I'm reminded of, uh, you know, Syngman Rhee, who in like, you know, eight years got a BA, MA, and a PhD, all, you know, from George Washington, Harvard, and Princeton. Um, you know, how, how, I mean, that's what, that's what he did, but I don't know if, I don't know if at this point um, in the 30s, uh, Kong is, is gently satirizing him, but it's, it's definitely possible, but mm -hmm. anyway. But it's also, he also talks about, speaking of the Chinese restaurant, I think it comes a little later, he also talks about how all the waiters basically has PhDs. Yeah, um, exactly. The uh, Chinese waiters. <laughs> and, and one of them is an MD. <laughs> right. And yeah. um, also his experience with, I believe it was in Boston, with 
I feel like we are giving way way too many plot points. But you know, when he was he meet, meets on. <laughs> yeah, this isn't even the plot. This is just yeah. like the extra stuff. <laughs> yeah, but he meets this African American man who is working um, as, as an elevator boy, basically. Yeah. But he also is, I believe, you know, it's kind of implied that he worked. He's uh, he's studying at Harvard, and he just kind of says, "What kind of job can I have other than yes, sir, jobs?" I mean, that's exactly like sort of his words. So this. And Chung Pa Han um, also has this series of jobs, everything from waiter to door to door encyclopedia salesman, even though he's not even quite sure that's what he's doing. Um, he works as a department store clerk. He works as a assistant to like a evangelical sort of minister. Um, so he has all these different jobs. And in, in a sense, I think that is sort of such a prototypical thing that many immigrants go through, no matter where they come from, um, no matter what their background is, and no matter what their education level is, when they first come, they really seem to go through this. Do you think he was very much aware of it? And was he writing about the immigrant experience? It's just how unstable and um, transient you can be um or what, what do you think he was trying to show when as um tom mentioned earlier it's a you know some people describe this novel as picaresque because there are all these different places that he goes to and different experiences that he has but what do you think um i know i shouldn't say this that i shouldn't say what was the writer's intention but i think what was he trying to show by showing all these different type of experiences that Chung Pahan has throughout, you know, actually very short period of time, actually. I feel, and like, it's do you of, I feel like it's a portrait of America that emerges mm. more than, uh, it's, it's saying that it's an immigrant experience sort of like uh, neglects the fact that what he's actually showing is the absurdity of how Mm. America dealt with immigrants at the time and still does um, by not acknowledging their credentials and their value. Uh, and so being left to do all of these odd jobs, you know, being a PhD who's also a waiter, for example, like that's, that's part of uh, the ridiculousness that, um, that comes when uh, you go through that sort of dehumanizing experience. Um, <clears throat> so it was really, uh, it was really for me more a picture of the United States that I saw than as much as I saw, you know, the experience of immigrants. Yeah, I, I, I think that's correct. Um, I mean, it's many things. I mean, what I love about this book is that it is, um, you know, on some level an immigrant story, uh, a Korean story, um, but it's also, you know, just, you know, you mentioned before, Jay, he starts at the bottom, right? He start, he's homeless, basically, his second day in New York. And um, I would also say he realizes pretty soon that just being able to quote English poetry to people is not going to cut it in America. Like he, he tries at a lunch counter and they're like, what are you talking, you know, what are you talking about? So it's sort of like, and he's very poetical to the point of maybe even being slightly annoying in the grassroots. Like every couple pages, he's, you know, there's, a, there's more, there's a more poems. And, and um, what I think is so cool about East Coast West is that he, even without reading the grassroots, he, you know, this is his character and he's, he's coming here with, with all these lofty um, ideas about, about literature, but also about the West, right? And then day two, he's homeless and he's got to get by on his wits. He's got to get by on, you know, his good nature and his connections. And he's sort of, it's, it's a survival story in that way. Um, but also to Alex's point, it's, it's not just about the immigrants and the Koreans. It's the way he um, captures, um, you know, non, how, how should I say, Caucasian Americans who, you know, who he meets, some of whom are, are very good to him, others are not. Um, uh, he's, he's a houseboy for like a, one miserable week in, out in Long Island. He has all these, you know, some jobs that are, that are kind of horrendous, but 
he gives you so many characters. Like it's even hard to count how many characters, vivid, um, really uh, amazingly captured characters that, that there are in this book. Um, at one point, uh, a senator picks him up while he's hitchhiking and kind of, <laughs> I feel like he, this guy, his name is Senator Kirby. And he has such a good time talking to uh, Chung Pa that he's like, um, okay, okay, let me just <laughs> go to him. Yes, young man, I can see you have come to America to stay and I'm proud and glad. Now you must definitely make up your mind to be American. Don't say I'm a Korean when you're asked, say I'm an American. And then Chung Pa says, but an Oriental has a hard time in America. He is not welcomed much. And then Kirby just like talks over him. There shouldn't be any ifs, ands, or buts. Like he's sort of, one of the great things that Kong does in this book is he knows when, when to hold back uh, in terms of Chung Pa's point of view and just let other characters talk. I think this is such a, this is one of the reasons I think I, I actually love this book. Whereas with the grass roof, I, I kind of, it's, it's very interesting and, and I'm glad to have read it, but there's a little bit too much Chung Pa in that one. And here he's sort of, he's sort of taking it all in and he's really capturing these voices. Um, you know, I don't, I, I won't keep going on and on, but there are just some wonderful, uh, characters and a lot of really great comic characters. He's just very, very funny. And, and humor, you know, humor from the thirties reflecting the twenties has no right to really hold up now, but it really does. Um, I, I, it's very entertaining in many ways. Yeah. And there's also a point to make about the picaresque as a form, which is that it's not just a kind of whimsical flight of fancy, uh, it's, Picaresque uh, means to show uh, the layers of a society. Uh, and it's a kind of tour through those layers, uh, a kind of uh, adventure among the social classes, if you will, uh, by moving across them. So, you know, we see him, yes, broke and uh, in a Chinese restaurant trying to write a poem to pay for his dinner. We see him in a, a a, a very expensive car with a senator who is getting a huge kick out of him while he's hitchhiking. So it's, you know, it's this, uh, and, and in a way, you know, the, the picaresque as a literary form does sort of play to some of the, uh, to the fancies of the, you know, the American ideal of class mobility, but, uh, but at the same time by having Chung Pa also like argue that, as he puts it, it's not so easy uh, for an Oriental. Um, uh, we see how that, how, like, we see how that works to create friction within that narrative. Yeah. And I think one of the most um, striking part, at least for me, was um, there was an Indian character Renza, I believe, or something like that, his name. And they were. In, this is the time when they're in Philadelphia. And he's a very sort of the strident nationalist who is arguing for um, Indian independence. And he kind of yeah. diffused the situation during the, sort of the, that very tense moment between him and... Um, and the, the party, which is mostly Caucasians, um, by basically making it into, turning it on to him. He talks about, well, you know, Korea is suffering too under Jap Japanese. And it was such an interesting way. I mean, we, it's only recently we talk about the word code switch and how Sometimes we have, you know, all, you know, if you're a non-white person, you always kind of take on, on certain characters for others and you're kind of performing. And it, it was really like, that was kind of a moment when I just felt like he was doing it without realizing that that's what he was doing. And throughout the book, there are so many instances there where I just read it, even though this is written almost 80 years ago, um, some of them, a lot of the, incidents in the book that could have happened today. And we, our response may be not that different from how he reacted to it. So the um, 
subtitle of the this book is uh, "Making of an Oriental Yankee," and which is not Oriental is not necessarily the word we use a lot these days. But do you think did he really have a real sense of how he could really become an American? Um, even though, and I I think there was a strong sense that he really. Chose to come to the United States. He really wanted to be in the United States. Um, do you think there was a really sense of him how he could really truly be an American, or was he always? Do you think he was always struggling do, with that idea? Do you mean the? Do you mean Kong, or do you mean the character? At least in the in difference. the book, yeah, yeah. I think in the book, Chang Pa seems to be much more optimistic, at least. Um, or. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. And I think there, there is this optimism, like you're talking about that, that anecdote that you mentioned with, with the Indian student, I'd, I'd forgotten about it. It's a great scene and he's kind of like, you know, diffusing it. Um, I think there are also examples of that Korean concept of nunchi in this book mm -hmm. where he kind of like reads the room and, and um, you know, the way he deals and interacts with strangers is, is, really, is really fascinating. Um, I guess I would say he's not, you know, as funny as this book can be, and um, and it is very funny. He, you know, there are so many scenes where it's clear sort of what the what the uh, injustices are, right? And it's not even all, you know, and, you know, people who are have some racist feelings towards Asians. It's just kind of at all levels. Um, I would also add that I believe East Goes West and the subtitle were both uh, the making of an Oriental Yankee. Those were kind of both um, sort of imposed by the publisher, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, Death of an Exile or Death of that I think was his working title, which is a far more like uh, serious, you know, a very serious mm -hmm. um, kind of gives it a different note. And and I think Alex, you mentioned in your introduction or maybe it's also in Sun Young's afterward, um, Sun Young Lee of Kaya, um, that, uh, you know, originally they wanted it to be, uh, Maxwell Perkins wanted it to have, um, have Chung Pa kind of get the girl, right? And in, in, in real life, uh, Young Hill Kong uh, marries a, a the, the description is always like a Wellesley graduate, but he, he marries a, a uh, white American woman. And so why can't this happen in the book as well? And there is, there is this moment, actually, I, I don't wanna give too much away. There, there is a moment in the book where you think it's, that's gonna be the way it goes, but it's far more ambiguous and I think far more um, ambivalent uh, actually about, about how, to, how to be a, mm. a Yankee or an Oriental Yankee. I don't know if people can see this, but I have a, a first edition here and it's dedicated to his wife. Francis Dealey. Um, yeah. And it says, uh, dedicated to Francis Keeley, who has saved my life from the fate of exile and collaborated in the making of this book. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, the, the real uh, Young Il Kang, uh, if I remember this correctly, um, came to the US uh, as the, uh, he was assisting in the translation of Paul Bunyan from uh, English into Korean. Yeah. His, uh, his evangelical. Uh, I think it might have been John Bunyan. Was it John? Like the, Sorry, John. The, Bunyan. the religious writer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although Paul Bunyan might. <laughs> Paul Bunyan is, is kind of. That would have been, yeah. Kind of, that would have been good too, though. <laughs> and, uh, and the, they helped him get uh, into the country, but it, it, I'm pretty sure he, he crossed the border from Canada uh, without papers. And when he applied for his Guggenheim, he applied as a stateless person. Um, he, uh, he had both the total belief that Korea had been destroyed and also in some ways, some, some allegiance to the country and culture that he also would not surrender, which is really interesting to, uh, 
to think about, in, especially in these times. Um, the novel is not particularly optimistic um, about uh, whether or not Changpa Han can become an American, uh, even if Young Hill Kang eventually did. Um, and, uh, and that's really worth uh, thinking about in the difference. Um, in arguing for the book as he wrote it with his editor, he, you know, he was arguing for an artistic vision that he wanted to uh, portray of the difficulties that he saw, even if they weren't difficulties that he himself was experiencing. He was writing in solidarity with the experiences of others who were less fortunate with him than he was. And then so there's that question you just mentioned that he's working Ted was a death of an exile. And there is a line in the book um, talks about the sort of a difference between being on an exile versus transplanted. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, so do you think the book is trying, trying to say that, I guess, do you think the book, book is trying to say that you have to choose to be transplanted instead of, because there are characters in the book and they always talk about how much they miss Korea. And there's always, when they meet other immigrants, they always talk yeah. about, are you gonna go back? Um, yeah. You know, are you just here for a while or, and then are you gonna go back? There's always that question of, are you really here or are you gonna, are you just here for a little I bit? I, I, re I think I remember the line you're talking about where he says the Koreans, I think he might've been talking about the men at the Korea Institute, um, which I would be interested in just learning more about, like what exactly was this place, but um, that they were exile in body only, right? So their minds are, they're, they're here physically in America, in New York, but their, their minds and their spirits are still kind of um, in, in Korea. And, you know, I think you, you put your finger on it. Like, I think the, the book is trying to make sense of it. I mean, it is a 350 page debate kind of about what, what, that, what that would even mean to, to be here as, um, to be American um, and, and sort of the conditions of, of exile. Um, I, was gonna, I was gonna say something else on this point. Um, all right, it's escaped me, but I'll, but I'll come back to it. But well, yeah, I, I think this, yeah. Is, this is kind of the central, the central question. I mean, it, it has to be acknowledged that, uh, you know, at the time, uh, they, they were considered citizens of Japan, right, left the US, more than they were considered Koreans in certain official capacities that like, part of the reason for his rejection of, for his claiming statelessness when he applied for the Guggenheim, is that he didn't want to apply as a citizen of Japan. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it's a, you know, it's a particular, the Japanese occupation is not obviously as much of a character as it is in, in the grass roof inescapably, but, but it is the background and it is also the, the condition under which uh, many of the Koreans who are there are there. Um, it's, it's interesting, like you, that's like, a, you know, it, the Japanese occupation is, you know, that's the dominating force in the grass roof. But you're right, like once he gets here, you know, there, I believe he, you know, he meets some, at least one Japanese person. And then there's a, he meets this Korean patriot who is, who stabs the, like a, a, a Korean who he thinks is in, in cahoots with the Japanese. Like and they're kind of, it's kind of like beyond his, ex, like outside of his experience now. And I think that is actually one kind of positive thing in a way that, it's not that he's rejected his Koreanness, but he is he is free from what he from the destroyed planet, right? That was the setting of uh, of the grass roof. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that the whole what Alex, what you're saying about not wanting to travel with a Japanese as a Japanese citizen, like that sort of comes into play, uh, you know, in the later parts of the grass roof. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say just about exile um, without giving away the plot. Uh, as to the degree that there is a plot, the we should just mention that there are, there's Chung Pa Han, who is our narrator, but there are also two Koreans in New York who have been here a bit longer. One of them, 
uh, is he has some connection to like he he has a letter of introduction. Uh, this guy named George Jones, George. who's just like a very um, he's kind of embraced you know the jazz age or whatever you want to call it. Like he's going out with showgirls. He's like there's just a great scene at the beginning where uh, Alex mentioned this too. You know he he finally um, shows up at his apartment on West 72nd Street and invites Chung Pao to stay. And he has his first shower there. And he says it, feel, it felt like being inside a flower, like just, you know, so much time spent on like uh, grooming as, as Alex put it. Um, so that's one character. And then we have the older character who's been, uh, been in, I believe in New York, but definitely in America for 16 years, uh, Toan Kim, who lives in the village, who is very artistic, very cultured, but there's something about him that has sort of given up on Korea. And yet, you know, without saying too much, like is definitely, he's not kind of um, assimilated to the degree that George is. There's, if, if George is kind of the sunnier character, this guy is definitely, you know, plunged in melancholy. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, I just, as a novelist, I think this is brilliant of Kong to have these two, two extremes. And I don't think those two ever really meet. So it's sort yeah. of like, he'll visit one, visit the other. And um, kind of, we get, we, we kind of get the idea from the way he interacts with both of them and, and how he comes, yeah. you know, he comes away from those meetings with, with thoughts about you know, exile and so forth. There's, uh, there's, a there's a beautiful passage uh, in, uh, in the first section of the book where he's talking about how much he loves New York. Uh, that I think is uh, something that I also really connected to, which is whatever he felt about America, he loved New York. And <laughs> reading with New York, and, you know, um, uh, he says uh, just a couple of lines here. Um, From an old wild Korean city, some thousand years old Seoul, famous for poets and scholars to New York. I did not come directly, but almost. A large steamer from the Orient landed me in Vancouver, Canada, and I traveled over 3,000 miles across the American continent, a journey more than half as far from Yokohama to Vancouver. At Halifax, straight away, I took another liner, and this time for New York. It was in New York I felt I was destined really, quote, to come out from the boat. The beginning of my new existence must be founded here. In Korea, to come out from the boat is an idiom meaning to be born, as the word pi for womb is the same as pi for boat. And there's a story of a Korean humorist who had no money who needed to get across a river. Uh, and then he goes on to tell the story of the humorist. And, uh, but it's essentially like, you know, he feels reborn in New York, reborn through arriving here. So it's a- just like Just like so many other artists and writers before him yeah. and after him, right? Um, his description of New York is priceless, but we should also point out that as Kang um, gained so much success with both novels, it's also true that he did come to New York, uh, come to the US right before the ban on Asian immigrants were imposed. and. He really, it took him a long time, even though he married an American woman, um, it took him a long time to actually become an American citizen. Um, I believe there's all these stories of, um, there, was, there, was, there was actually a senator who tried to pass a bill in Congress to make him, in, um, make him a, an exception for him. And um, all these people, obviously, including his friends and you know, supporters like Max Perkins, wrote this document and tried to, um, you know, uh, try to have in the citizenship granted and it was never really success successful. And he didn't really become the U.S. citizen until much later. Um, and his wife and also lost her citizenship for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, for marrying him. For marrying him, yeah. which is... It was extreme. <laughs> and, and also we have to, after this brilliant book, um, and we should also point out that The Grass Roof was a 
critical, not only a critical success, but it was also commercially successful. Um, and after the East Goes West, he never um, published his own book. Um, he didn't write another novel. I'm, I'm, maybe he wrote something, but he never published. And you know, it, what happened to him after this book came out becomes very sort of fuzzy and we get little anecdotes here and there. So, and again, we don't want to make any conjectures whatsoever, but what do you think happened? Um, he Obviously, he was this brilliant idea, um, writer. He had so many um, ideas and, you know, he definitely had the skills to do it. Um, and he had, he seemed, it seemed like he had a support system. Um, so what do you think happened? <laughs> I know that's a very uh, it's a hard question. Slippery. I don't know, you know, I, I this the this penguin edition, aside from Alex's introduction, you know, it also has this really um in-depth uh afterward, which I found eye-opening as well. And um, you know, there's a suggestion that the Korean War, even though he was in the he was in the in America as it was leading up to it like kind of broke him but why why what happened before that like that is until that doesn't start um until 1950 until 1950 but also you know even <laughs> there's that you know kind of post-war period like what's happening in in the early 40s and i don't i don't really know i i have some conjectures and I, that i'm just thinking about now but one might be that he's written about the most exciting parts of his life. Not that he is only an autobiographical author by any means. Um, we've seen how he's, you know, he's as a novelist, he's tremendously skilled in putting these in, the, in really um, kind of transmuting this experience into really compelling fictional form. But after like, you know, a harrowing escape uh, from his homeland and after, you know, a serial comic, you know, journey across uh, across America, and you know what is what is left, and maybe what's left is a domestic novel that nobody wants to read. Maybe um, maybe the climate uh, going into the forties, um, particularly after uh, Japan, um, you know, the U.S. enters the war against Japan. And I, you know, I think one of the one of the, one of the ironies in the book is like people are forever mistaking him for Chinese or for Japanese, and the latter kind of really, really gets his goat for obvious reasons. But I don't know. I mean, this is all just I'm I'm just speculating. But I wonder if the appetite um, for this kind of book about Asia kind of um, lessens as we get into the '40s and get into World War II. Um, I I don't know. That's that's just speculation. But also his ability to write a novel as a, of that kind, uh, since he has effectively, you know, whether you consider him having emigrated or, um, or living here as a kind of a refugee, um, he, you know, that, like you said, that experience might not have been what publishers wanted to see from him. I'd be very curious about uh, what papers are in his archives. He obviously, when you look at the timeline of his, uh, of his life, he continues uh, to work with a scholar. Um, he also does a certain amount of uh, advising to the American government on different, uh, in different capacities. Um, uh, you know, travels to Korea as chief of publications for the American military governments Office of Public Information, that's 1946 to 1947, for example. Um, that must have been incredible to go back. Uh, I did look for, I recently was writing about the end of the Japanese occupation and I was trying very hard to find if Young Hill Kang had written anything about the end of the occupation because I could only mm. imagine that it must have been so incredibly emotional for him. Mm. Um, and uh, like what it was like for him to hear the news. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a quote here uh, from something uh, 
where he discusses how the 38th parallel is Korea's deadline. Uh, you know, um, Korea's life and blood circulation was stopped on that line and could not flow from either direction. Um, so it's his relative silence. It's hard to know whether it's uh, whether it's his, of his own making or of, of the markets. You know, um, I was also Alex. Yeah. You've 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 uh, you're a Nabokov fan, and you've mentioned the Nabokovian uh, you know nature of his writing, and I just I kind of think of Nabokov as like another model of exile, right? And, and he, he actually lived in the US far, for a far briefer time than, um, than Kong and, you know, his success took a different trajectory. But I often wonder, you know, I know toward the end of his life, Kong is, he applies, I think he applies for another Guggenheim and he wants to write about like the, the cultural history of artistic history of Korea and North, uh, Northeast Asia. And I just wonder if, you know, if he he could have con maybe he couldn't conceive of himself as a different kind of writer, but someone who, and I'm being very reductive, but like Nabokov kind of goes, he's an he's as exile as they come, right? He's he's booted from Russia, he's booted, he loses everything, booted from Europe, uh, escape you know escaping sort of um, the German advance, but then, you know, he turns that material into um, this kind of magical like interior uh somewhat fantastical fiction and i don't know I, maybe this is something you know if i'm thinking of like what would a possible route what what might it have been for kong i mean now i'm just just now thinking like what if he had done that um mm -hmm. maybe there would still be no audience and maybe it, maybe there is something about uh, some kind of like you know it, it very well could be some kind of structural or unconscious bias in 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 the reading public or you know in in, in publishing houses that uh was denying him or it could just he could have just dried up i mean we don't we don't quite know he was definitely working a lot uh, as alex mentioned um and you know he had a kind of a career as a as a lecturer kind of a freelance lecturer as we get into the um 50s and 60s but uh, you know, what, what happened to his actual fiction writing um, is, I, I think it, it's a bit of a mystery. There's some, he seems possibly, you know, it's possible that he was, he became consumed with his anti-Japanese efforts inside of the United States, um, like many Korean Americans who were in the U.S. did. Um, it's also true that, uh, uh, you know, there's, like something that I would have loved to hear him write about in some ways would have been something that actually, because of his actual positions, he might not have written something that I would want to read, but it's essentially like, you know, Koreans who were in America when the Japanese were put into the camps often were at pains to distinguish themselves from the Japanese. There was a lack of solidarity yeah. uh, in that sense, you know, which, is in retrospect, both understandable and also difficult to reconcile because of the, of the exceptional personal cost of Japanese Americans at the time, uh, who paid a terrible price for being Japanese American uh, in America. Um, and uh, so him writing about- Interesting, yeah. Like that would have been potentially, I think, quite interesting, but he was also writing things like the Japanese mind is sick <laughs> when the Japs march in, like he had suffered pretty terribly uh, during the occupation. So it's, it's probably asking him a lot to have reconciled that, but mm. still it, it has to be thought of uh, in this case. And all those positions would have been uh, mm. Mm. not like, not so legible to an American reading public. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to end actually with one of the viewer's question. Um, the viewer asks, um, how did Kang's voice, a Korean voice encountering America nearly a century ago, impact your sense of being Korean in America today? Um, Alex, do you want to start? 
Sure. I think, you know, uh, as I say in my introduction, um, I had been made to feel for so long like I was some kind of uncanny object in the United States. You know, it took me so long to realize that not everyone was asked, so how did your parents meet? <laughs> Um, and I actually knew the story, so I would tell the story and people would nod along. And of course, the, the less polite version of that story is, what are you? Um, you know, uh, Kang's experience of being misidentified uh, in the United States is, I mean, one thing that I, have, that I have said before is that I do feel like one of the few experiences that Asian Americans have in common is misidentification. Uh, being mistaken for another another ethnicity than than your own. Um, uh, so it was yeah it was powerful to realize that um, that I had in a sense a literary ancestor who was such a incredible uh, writer who um, who wrote was one of the few. Uh, non-Black American writers to write about uh, Harlem in the Jazz Age um, and to include Black characters in his fiction seriously. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that were still solidarities that we're still trying to nurture uh, to this day. So it was powerful. How about you, Ed? That's a great answer. I'm, I guess I would say, um, you know, I've known about Kong for a, for a while. Uh, actually, you know, Sun Young Lee at Kaya, you, I, I, we're friends from college and she had sent me <laughs> East Coast West way back when. And I couldn't, you know, the, I, I, I'm still kind of like this. The first few pages didn't get me. Like, and they are, you know, even returning to them today, they're, they're quite dense and kind of like, what is going on? So I kind of put it aside and I didn't really read it till this reissue. Um, uh, the, the Penguin Classics one, but um, what can I say? It feels like this book shouldn't exist. And it feels like kind of a minor miracle that it's, it's in print so that we can read it, but also that it was written at all. Um, and, you know, for a lot of the reasons that, that we've been discussing that, that Alex just pointed out, um, I'll just say it, it's, you know, as a, as a novelist, I'm, tremendously inspired by it. There's something about it that just like, it's all over the place. Like he's gonna do it all, um, uh, both in terms of, you know, the characters and the humor and the tragedy and, and writing about not just, you know, Koreans and whites, but other people of, you know, people of color to use that overused term. It's, it's really thrilling. Um, I'm also just, uh, you know, kind of in awe of his um, of his technique and his way of, um, you know, setting up scenes, make, making things pay off, his jokes and his humor, like all of that uh, is tremendously inspiring. And just to just to kind of, I feel like we've been given this gift, you know, to to be able to read this now. And as I'm, you know, just on a personal note, as I'm sort of finishing up a, a novel of my own, like. It, on these in this last kind of stretch, like ever since I read it last year, it's really just been, if I can say this without sounding immodest, like it just, you know, I just kind of look at this book and think, well, look at what <laughs> look what he did. Like, like let's 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 do it. Let's try a little harder. Um, mm. And uh, you know, I'm I'm very I'm very grateful that he lived and wrote, and I'm grateful that we can we can all read it again. Well, I think we can go on and on and talk about this book, obviously, because there's so much to talk about, but that's all we have for now. So I just want to say thank you again to Alexander Chi and Ed Park for joining us today. We wish you all the best and stay healthy, and we can't wait to read what you will write. Um, but Mostly we wanted you to read this book too. That's what this program was all about. You can order East Goes West uh, from wherever you order your books. So go to web our website if you want more information. 
Special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility. And our interns, Jia and Hiju, for getting all the questions and doing social media postings and um, doing the email outreach. And of course, our thanks to you, our members and viewers. Um, we hope you'll join us again next week. Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org, where you can sign up to receive our emails or join us as a member and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and happy reading. So good night. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. everyone.